हेलो हाय राहुल एम आई ऑडिबल यस नैना हेलो यस नैना यू आर ऑडिबल Hello Naina I cannot hear you Hi Ankita am I audible now Yes very much how are you uh, doing I am good absolutely fine how are you I'm doing great thank you first of all thank you for this opportunity it's really very um like it's difficult for me to describe in words at the moment but I'm very happy and honored to be here thank you even we are very glad you you know uh, you adjusted your time according to indian standard i know how hard it is on a saturday uh, i guess it's saturday morning <sighs> yeah this is saturday morning but no it's no i didn't adjust anything uh, it's i'm a morning person and then this Oofa. is the only time we get to actually you know get wrap up uh, like you know ramp up with the studies and everything so so no it's it's very nice to see you like i miss that time uh, you know talking to people back home so it's okay thank you for that any time okay. okay so uh, we shall wait for another 5 minutes and yes. let's wait for prashant sir also to join and then we will get started absolutely yeah okay. how are you doing did you guys get vaccinated yet uh, no not yet we are waiting for our chance Oh yeah that's true. And uh, what yes. about you? I mean how things uh, are there? Yeah, we did get vaccinated on the second dose was recently completed. Okay. So yeah, in January. Okay. It's going good. Okay. We're just hoping for um like the thing to end finally hopefully soon. Mhm mm mhm. Mm so things are back to normal. I mean how things are after getting vaccinated? I mean is there any difference you uh, uh i won't say that there is a difference because we still have to practice the same guidelines as suggested like the mask has to be on um in order for covid to go okay so we're practicing the same or as earlier trying to be you know um like social distancing and then mm -hmm. um, obviously all the in infection control protocol being in clinics even outside even the general population i feel like everybody is following the same way the vaccine is just a way of uh, you know feeling okay that okay this is what was going to get us into the next step but other than that i think uh, we're still practicing the same uh, guidelines as suggested by the state okay. um <clears throat> how about in yeah okay. sorry sorry to cut no, you no, off please continue please continue how about in india that, like i want to listen so much more about it <laughs> so we are uh, waiting for the vaccination i i do not actually read about read much about it but yes uh, first they will be giving vaccination to healthcare workers and then mm -hmm. uh, there is a you know there is a queue yeah yeah so then maybe for late 20s or early 30s will come <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, pretty healthy population then. <laughs> yeah, in numbers, yes. Nice. So uh, I'll just check with Prashant sir, and yes. then we can get started. Just Absolutely. Just two minutes more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone, uh, you know, on a Saturday evening, uh, taking out time. Um, and uh, yes, we will be starting in two minutes. Shansar is coming. Sure. Um, so are you from Indore? Uh, um, I am from basic, like my hometown is Betul, if you know about okay. that place. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> so it is near Bhopal and then uh, like I got married in Indore and that is how I shifted here. Nice. Very nice. You are from Indore, right? Born, born I, No, I went to school uh, in Indore. So I'm not from Indore, I am from Ujjain. Okay, okay. But, um, but yeah, I went to dental school back home in Indore. So, but Indore has like, um, like, you know, like college memories, the inseparable part of your career, <laughs> of your life, actually. Yes, exactly, exactly. No matter what, which city are, uh, you are in, but college life is. Yes. There. So to me, Indore is like, I am from Ujjain, like mm -hmm. born and raised in Ujjain, which is close by to Indore, mm -hmm. but I consider myself from Indore. <laughs> it's, because of, <laughs> it's because of the connection that I built during uh, when I was a student. Mm -hmm. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. I'll be back in a minute. Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, um, Ankita Prashant sir is here. I'll just share yes. my screen. Just a minute. Ankita, click on enable editing. Yeah, just pure slide. Karo. Enable editing. Yes, yes, sir. Actually, I uh, do, I do not use uh, Google, I mean, Microsoft Word. It is on trial basis. So I cannot I, enable editing. Okay, so send me this file. In a, in a second, I'll just download it, right? Uh -huh. so, yes, sir. It's there in the email, actually. So I'll send it uh, again. And I'll just stop sharing. I have it, I have it, I have it. I have yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just stop sharing my screen. I'll just do this in a minute. Hope it's done, sir. Guys, I'm sharing the screen. Can you cut these hours of being up to your stay? Mute curry. G, G. Right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And where can we have Ankita? Are you here? Hey, Rashan, sir. How are you? It's so good to see you. Finally, 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 Ankita. How is everything? 
everything is going good, just busy, but amazing. How are you? How is everything with you? Fantastic, all okay. Super excited for today's session with you. And I hope it's not an early, uh, you know, uh, morning for you. We did bother <laughs> no, no. you, I guess. <laughs> no, no, no. I am honored to be here. So, no, it's an amazing day. Um, and I'm very happy to do this and very excited just like you are. Thank no, you thank so you. much for, for, for providing, you know, this opportunity to me. I'm very, very happy to help and share my experience and uh, to be here today with you and all. Great. So you had a fantastic journey and I've been a witness of it for over the years. And I thought that, you know, because we keep doing webinar sessions with our amazing alums all over the world. And uh, we would make sure that a uh, certain level of information and awareness must reach to the fraternity that, that those students belong to, from computer science to MIS to dentistry to public health, right? So that those students can really make a well-informed decision and the way you have transformed your career in life. We might have some more examples following your legacy. That's so sweet of you to say. Thank you so much. Yes, students do uh, look up to, you know, like making things happen entire time. Just like you said, you have been, you have been a very crucial part of my journey, by the way. And I am really very blessed to have you as a mentor. And I am very, like, I'm very happy for students, those who are currently are in contact with you and, you know, taking your um, advice. And uh, that's how I started long back when things were, like from number one, right from scratch. So, Fantastic. yeah. So uh, again, of course, with this introductory chat with Ankita, I'm welcoming uh, entire audience. You know, thank you everyone for chipping in and uh, we will have your questions, uh, you know, at the end of the webinar. So please do keep your questions ready in brief. Uh, uh, it would be appreciated one student, one question so that we can finish in time. Uh, and if the connection breaks down, uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be fixing it right back and we'll resume the webinar if at all uh, this happens. So all the dentists and healthcare professionals, right? So we have a, Ankita, today we have a class of all, let's call it a class. So we have a class of around 20. <laughs> 25, 26 students and hope more would chip in in, in coming um, uh, minutes. Um, so, you know, just a brief introduction of, you know, yours, if we can have, and then let's start some interesting questions and answers. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Ankita. I am from India and I'm a foreign trained dentist back home. And uh, it's been four years in the U.S. Currently, I am pursuing a DDS program here at the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. Before, when I actually came to the US to pursue my education and all that, I had invested my time um, to come here and see how dentistry here looks like. Because before I came here in 2017, I had been a private practicing dentist for almost a decade. I am from Ujjain and uh, got married in Ratlam, went to dental school in Indore, back home, and then now uh, got married in Ratlam, and me and my spouse, we both have had a private practice. We owned it for almost 10 years, but during that time, I came here to, you know, to see how things looks, look like here, how a U.S. dentistry is. I was always fascinated because we always kept reading articles about, you know, the, the journals and things like that. So when I came here, I was really fascinated by the U.S. dental healthcare, the way things work here. They're so higher end, and it is amazing to be a part of this. I, I'm. I would not consider myself yet because I'm not quite there yet. But um, it is so comprehensive. It's like a comprehensive clinical patient-centered approach that we are learning, and that's exactly what I did. I wanted to do in life, right from. And this is coming from a clinician who has been practicing. Could see the difference that okay, this is what I want to be, and from there that journey started. So that was the key thing that when I witnessed things here when I was coming to. That's when I had the zeal that I have to be here. I can just see something in chat. I think students cannot. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Sure. Can give me a thumbs up. Okay. Yeah, I was, okay. So yeah. Um, and then finally I took my path towards this had uh, my entrance exams cleared, which are NBD part one and part two. 
and then you need TOEFL. I applied for that, um, applied for many schools. You, the key is like, you have to apply to several schools, but nothing happened. Like, you know, it, I didn't really get any invites or anything. So I was feeling maybe, you know, you need to build the profile over the period of time. Finally, um, I took the path of grad school here at the University of Minnesota in 2017. Finished my grad school, had been and then I've been working in research since then. It's been almost three years now that I've been working in research, and then continued to apply, and finally got accepted this year at the University of Minnesota. So um, this is me in a very small um, introduction, if I could call that, uh, and I'm very happy to share the more, the more and more as questions go. So of course, you know we have our questions but now you've already started seeing you know what dentistry is in us and how the practice goes so let's just start with the differences in the approach in india and in us and you know despite it's a dds program right how is still you know uh, worthy and valuable it is so let's talk about the differences absolutely so I do miss practicing back home because uh, it started on, like I started on my own kind of right after when I was a freshman and jumped into private practice. There were challenges with that as well. It, it takes time to establish yourself, get those public relations and all that. And I was all about it. That's what I wanted to have public relations build up, have the trust build up and learning has never stopped. That's the key, uh, I would say that's the main reason for me being here in the US. Dentistry in India was amazing. I was doing good, but I never wanted to settle down to what I know. I wanted to learn more and more, grow more as a professional and in terms of higher end technology. So the US dental practice, if I could call, is like it's more of higher end working around technology and it's a very different practice than the US. Uh, so in, in India, it's very different. And it's like not just India. In the US, it's very different in comparison to, I guess, all part of the world. So um, yeah, that's if I could, yeah, if you, I can have more specific questions on like practicing. As I said, it's more of comprehensive clinical care and patient-centered care. The limited ethics that we have to, um, you know, follow. There are more uh, strict regulations here versus other places. So it's definitely worthy to be um, doing DDS. Nothing beats that. Um, and there are other programs as well. It's not just like DDS is just one way to practice, mm -hmm. but it's the most, most, I would say it's competitive. It's highly competitive, but um, it allows you to practice in almost all the states in the US and also in few countries if you would want to go if you want to migrate to from here. So it's like a very important, it's a very important and uh, like very, I would say um, hard to earn to be, uh, uh, you know, to be that degree with you as a foreign trained dentist. Excellent. So, you know, uh, that's why it is, it is. So Prashant sir, I cannot hear you. Hello, hello. Is it audible now? I cannot, I cannot hear you. Okay, just a second. Can you hear me now? Uh, Angita, can you hear me now? Uh, the audience is able to hear me. Uh, Angita, can you hear me? Sir, Ankita still can't hear you, but the uh, rest of the students are saying they can. Oh, Ankita, can you hear Nana? Yeah, I can hear you, sir, properly. No, no, no. Can Ankita hear Nana? If you yeah. can. Ankita, can you hear me? Uh, I'll just text her here. Yeah, so I, I think she, if she can uh, add a headphone or something, uh, you know, I'll just with, text with her you. system, yes. Oh, 
Oh, she's already uh, using uh, earbuds, uh, airpods. Probably let's do it without it. If she can, uh, uh, you know, just do it directly. Uh, Ankita, can you hear us now? No. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. Let me remove the Bluetooth. Re log in. Uh, yeah, she can re log in. That's the yeah, best yeah. way. You can leave the meeting and join back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. So, dear students, just one minute. I think that, that that's how it's going to get sorted. Yeah, I have asked her to uh, re log in, leave the meeting and join again. Because she cannot hear us uh, still. I'm not sure how many are uh, dentists we have today or healthcare professionals, but I think it's a one of its own kind of a webinar, guys. Um, and that's where, should we do MPH, should we not? We had a lot of uh, dentists uh, currently on board who are going for healthcare informatics also, guys, right? So masters of public health to healthcare informatics, and then maybe some people would want to get back to dentistry and some are ready to leave dentistry as a profession, right? So which stage you are and what would you uh, want to do in, 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 in future? So based on that, we can definitely have a meeting later on, right? Um, and we've been seeing uh, the journey of a lot of dentists who, who went on to do DDS, but some got the job uh, post public health or, you know, healthcare informatics also. So uh, with all the dentists on board, we really need to make an informed decision what we want to do. Um, and we can put you in touch with a lot of dentists who are currently in US uh, and uh, pursuing dentistry or pursuing career in the field of public health. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of information that must be shared. Even fall 2021 intake, if you are the one who may want to go this year itself, uh, the, the application is still on till 1st of April for public health courses, right? Or healthcare informatics. If you want to apply for, you know, uh, you know, some other course, you know, we can always work around and discuss. We even had students in the field of dental materials also to add to the field that uh, dentists actually go. But dental material is very research oriented, very specific field. So uh, that's how, you know, uh, things work out. Yep. I can hear you now. Oh, yes. Thank you. You're back. <laughs> You sorry can hear about it that. All, okay, all sorted? Yes, yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. It happens sometimes, technical glitches and, you know, uh, but but still things are back. Let's let's continue. And the, one of the first questions, of course, you, you, you gave a hint on that, that you wanted to experience the, you know, dentistry in West particularly. Uh, but what was the tipping point? So 10 years in practice, this is something very astonishing. Uh, uh, pursuing the dentistry and then going ahead with the practice, established practice, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Leading dentist of the town. But then you suddenly take up a call and such comfort, leaving such comfort zone. Uh, you know, that that is one of the, uh, probably the most predictable part of your journey so far, no doubts. But then, you know, uh, you know how the family got convinced and, you know, I, I'm sure you led the way. But how did it happen and what was the tipping point and why abroad? What was the motivation? The motivation is like, I do not like things that are mundane. As I said, variety, as I say, variety is the spice of life. I do not want to settle down or sat, you know, settle down to what I know, was hungry for knowledge. It was not just, you know, 
just for being here and you know how it is like I was always interested in knowing more and more and growing and learning never stops so learning lifelong learning that's what the main zeal was and then when I was with I was visiting and then I got that impression that okay this is fantastic this is where I want to be that came the tipping point in the career and personal and professional both I felt like this is time to move on. I want to see myself 10 years from now, not in the same place, not in the same chair, not with the same people, because that's a very important part of personality. That's how I feel it, that you have to, you, you have to make your way, you have to make your way to go to see yourself that where do you want to be in 10, 15 years, not in one place doing the same old eight to five, the same thing that you know, I don't mean any offense to anyone, but this is me. I am somebody who would not settle down to something that is very, very monotonous. But it, yes, it was difficult um, family-wise as well. There was pressure because as you said, it was comfort. The, the life was very comfortable. I already had established everything, but I wanted to learn. And then higher end technology is something that really pushed me hard to to, it was like it pulled me towards itself that I want to learn things the way they are and grow from now whatever I know to a higher level. That's why I came here. Fantastic. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, what are the major hurdles you faced in this process? Uh, <laughs> uncountable, as I must say, um, and this is not something new that people, those who are applying to the dental school here in the US, it's a very common word, as you must have heard, there are so many hurdles, the thing is like, it's very competitive to now get accepted, you have to have the entrance exam, when you take the entrance exam, that's how I was, when you take the entrance exam, you feel like, oh, I made it. I'm going, like, I, it's very soon, but entrance exam, clearing those NBD part one, part two, it is just the first step. It's just, a, I would say, an eligibility criteria for you to meet, to be here, applying to the programs. The hardest part is to have US dental experience because that's where I think I struggled from because, for, because I was there despite of the practice I'd been applying with uh, you know same profile as in like um, having the scores from having this TOEFL score having uh, NVD part one part two and the and the practice I had but I didn't really quite get anything I realized that that's something I need to improve so graduate school and apart from graduate school, whatever experiences that I did here, like community services, there is a lot of community services that you need to be, we need to think like that because community service is something taken very seriously over here. So these were the small things that I didn't have right when I first applied, but as time grew and I came here and I gathered multiple experiences, it is not just, you know, like uh, just passing the exam, it's not that straight. You have to have everything in your profile because dental schools, they look at like, it's a holistic approach. The more you do, the lesser it is. That's how it is. So it was difficult to first get it into a US dental experience because the state where I am in at the moment, someone cannot hear, they say. I think it's fine, it's going well. Okay. So um, in my state, in Minnesota, you cannot practice, you cannot work as a dental assistant. Like there are norms, you have to go to the school, you have to be a licensed dental assistant to in order for you to be getting paid or getting a work. So it was difficult in my state. So that was the first hurdle because it is, it is a, I would, I won't say it's a required thing, but it's a, it's an added benefit if you are working here as a dental assistant. It helps you because they expect you to know how U.S. dental practice works because it is very different from the rest of the world. So that was something that I, it took time. It came in the end, it, but it took time for me to be there. Then the GPA is another thing. Like nowadays things are different, but back then when I went to dental school, it was very difficult to have a good GPA is also important. It is not the only required thing, but if you have it, you're you're ahead in you know in terms of hurdles. 
if I were to recall um, TOEFL score as well, I would say people say, oh, TOEFL is just an exam, like, you know, um, it's just a way, it's not just a way, it's important for them to know you that how can you commu better communicate because dentistry is all, it's not just about hands-on skills, it's about communication as well. They want to see, can you communicate well with the patients? Can you be understandable? So that's also an important aspect of the whole profile thing that you have to have a good TOEFL score. A good TOEFL score doesn't have a definition of a number, but unfortunately, given the competition, anything that you score above 110, 100, at least 105 is considered a good TOEFL score for here. 100 is itself is, is a good score in my opinion, but then the better you get, the better you are in the, in the race, in the competition. Excellent. So, of course, you brought them and I remember my talks with you. You said that, okay, even at this point of life, I'm, I'm moving to U.S., but I want dentistry in my life and I want to like continue my dentistry. And of course, you know, uh, at that point of time, MPH seemed one of the routes, right? Mm -hmm. That, okay, go build a profile, build connections, build networking. So, um, of course, now you are at the top of the game and you are there. So it would be good from like it would be good to hear from you that why MPH you know would be the first approach or any other masters or any grad program rather than you know why not students apply directly to DDS so you know just put some light on this absolutely so um, there is no harm in applying directly to DDS many students do that it is just that nowadays it has become so competitive that you already have thousands of applications with um, profile like PhDs with masters, some of them masters from their own country, from their home country, people with uh, US dental experience practicing as a dental assistant or a hygienist from past five years. And if you see, if you look at the people, those who are working, even my colleagues, you feel like, where do you stand? It is so hard to just apply with what you are doing back home, whichever country you are, it is difficult to get in. It is getting difficult day by day. It's not that nobody gets accepted. That's not what I'm saying, but it is difficult for, for a person to be just applying for directly to the DS program because they look at your profile. So grad school, which includes like, as you said, public health, it could be healthcare and administration, it could be health informatics and, uh, and some people even do, do MBA, like just imagine being a dentist. I, I know a friend, uh, a friend here in school, um, she's from Egypt and she did her master's in business administration. That was like very different than dentistry. But as you say, as they look at you, it's like they look at your personality. It's not about your paperwork. It's about, would you be the right fit about them? Because a dentist is not a dentist. I call it as a dent artist. You have to be an engineer. You have to be an artist. You have to be obviously scientific. Uh, you don't have to be a doctor. So you have to be so many things and it's all about your personality. They look at that. So people do all kinds of things that they can in order for, for, you know, for them to call as an improved profile or improvement in profile. So the variety of courses which are available, which are like grad school, they help you. And then Coming, we education system back home and in other countries is different than in the US. That platform of having a grad school, it helps you in understanding how things work here. Simple things work here, how to catch a bus from one place to another. It's not as simple as it is in India or in our own country. So, you know, simple things, but the entire time of your um, grad school that you're here, one year or two years program, you learn, you know, you, you come out of that culture shock after some time and you get accustomed to how things, how do I, how would I be as a dental student if I am, you know, doing writing papers, there's a writing emails, forget about anything, simple things like writing emails, but there are so many things that you learn during entire time when you are a grad student. And uh, that makes you like, it, it makes you, you feel more confident that yes, I am ready for it. And I think I'm going to get it now. So 
it, there are many things that go in there that why grad school and before before the dental school or other programs. So, so the likelihood by spending some time in the university pursuing a grad program before starting your DDS definitely enhances your chances of making it to DDS. Absolutely, I would, uh, yeah, I would highly support that. Um, they look at you, so MPH and, you know, um, even a healthcare administration, that involves a lot of hard work, as in like a lot of papers, we, we have to write down so many papers. That is considered as very, uh, like they see it as a very intellectual uh, thing because it is, like doing research or maybe um, you know writing papers, ample of papers, getting them published. This is a lot of hard work. They see it as a you know like a strong intel intellectual you know um, background that's coming from um, coming from you. And if once you get in here, you are definitely valued for the experience that or what you bring to the table. So it's, it's not just the degree at the end of the day that grad school gives you, it, it shapes you and they, they want to see that shape. So that is why I think it is, it is important for, for sure. Like I would encourage people to think about it, take a moment about it. There are short-term courses as well, but do not go for online courses. That's not something I would suggest because they are good. If you want to just learn, it's fine, but, um, it's nice to be, you know, to be on campus. It, it, it just changes you. It changes you to whole another level when you are here. Fantastic. So MPH can be a great filler and as well as it can be a great learning time. And mm -hmm. probably you understand the ways and then, and you also get a chance to interact with the people at this school, BDS and the admission committee and the professors. You do, but that depends upon school to school. Some schools do not really like that because they see you as a, if you are a potential um, applicant, then some schools do not like that kind of interaction, kind of, you know, uh, an approach to trying to get in. That's not something uh, very, very encouraged here at the U of M. But uh, definitely certain schools do like it that, yeah, they like that you're making that effort trying to make connections and, you know, so it depends upon which school you're applying to, but it certainly, there is no harm. If you are a dentist, you're a grad student, and um, if you're trying to build connections and letting them know, even if they're not letting them know, but trying to build connections, it's not going to harm. It's only going to uh, help you learn something new. You learn everything not everything is uh, there in books, right? It's just like you learn from people. Excellent. So of course, you know, you did the MPH very successfully and uh, what was your experience? And a student would want to know because of course, only thing probably the dentist or healthcare professional might have, have gone through is community dentistry or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, was, that's true. How was your MPH and uh, you know, uh, what were your experiences during, you know, your MPH? It was for two years? Yes, it was a two years program. Um, it was amazing, hard work, a lot of hard work, I would say, lot of writing papers, assignments, which was very different. That's not how I grew up back home. So that was an alarming, it was a like eye-opening thing for me. I'm like, okay, well, I this is something new. So it took time. First semester was like heavy, overwhelming. But then things were smooth. It was great. The teachers are amazing. The faculty, I must say, they are so supportive. Just like you are, you are like, you know, you're a mentor. That's how we have, uh, we had and we have faculty here to help you and they, you know, give you personal attention. So MPH was more like, um, yeah, yeah. It was like refine, refinement. That's what I call it. It was a refinement and a very crucial step in my career. Um, you get ample opportunities to do research. So if somebody is very research focused, MPH should be, uh, you know, should be uh, taken into consideration because you get opportunities even while being in the program. University of Minnesota is a very, like a highly research um, focused universities, one of the top among the US in case of research. So that helped me and I was interested in that. So 
you get experiences not in just one field of research, but you get research experience almost from multiple departments or multiple areas. And then once you graduate, that kind of profile helps you in earning a job as well, because getting a job in the US in whichever stream you are, it's, it's not easy as it sounds. It's different because you are not from here. And I'm sure people can relate to that. It takes time. But it takes. But if you have done your job well of being a student, having experiences, you know, uh, shadowing, or maybe volunteering at, or internships, as I call, or field experience, then it is not that difficult. It is difficult, but it is it's definitely like it's it's worthy it, and you get like if you have to have a good job then um, yes mph should be um, i would recommend in fact health informatics i would say health informatics itself is a very booming field if someone wants to let's say not do dentistry or you know quits that okay i'm done applying here i'm i'm not going to stress myself any further MHI should also be an option because it get you really work as a like you can work as a data analyst you can work in many areas and it it pays you well it gives you a very good comfortable life and a settled career obviously okay. in public health uh, how the courses uh, you know the shape of epidemiology biostatistics how it goes around actually yeah so um usually so if, like there are foundations of uh, public health, like basic courses, which everyone has to take regardless of whichever stream that you are doing public health in, which is uh, epidemiology, as you said, biostats, then healthcare system in the US, that's one of the very important courses that people take, or ethics, you know, and um, foundations of public health. It's also like a big course. The, so this is these are the cream ones. I would advise if somebody is doing MPH to divide it in a way because you are able to choose your own courses which are offered in one semester. So let's say if I wanted, I did not want to take epidemiology in my first semester because I was already overwhelmed with, with everything. So you can choose your credits. The minimum credits that you take here when you are in grad school is six. So that's minimum. That's what you qualify um, to be here on your visa. So anywhere, it should be six or more. So I selected my courses such a way that I don't feel very overburdened. So let's say just choose 10 to 11. And then that includes not more than three courses. And that can be a mix of a difficult course, a, a, a very moderate one, and a simple one to get straight A's. So if you divide and uh, manage time, manage your courses in a way that you want, if you would really, if you are a person that, no, I want straight A's, then you have to be well planned. Try and con to contact with people, those who are here already in the university, when you get accepted, you need to try to, you know, contact those people and know that what, what do you think should be taken? I made a wise decision to not choose epidemiology or biostats in my first semester because I was already overwhelmed. And I was that person who wanted, yes, I wanted straight A's. Whatever I want, whatever I'm doing, I want it to be nicely done. It can take time, but I want it to be nicely done, not just finish it up and then let's get over it. So I think that helps. So, uh, so Masters of Public Health and MHI, probably the two hottest options. And since these are the options which are mostly STEM because you do not find health administration courses in STEM designation, right? So That's I, true. these are the two courses that students can look forward to. And then if they want to continue with the public health career, they can, or if they want to get back to DDS and they have to make all those applying efforts and, you know, in that direction, is that okay? So let me tell you very, very honestly here. If you are that person who wants to settle in the US and you are a dentist and you're a freshman, you're in your twenties, you know, mid twenties, mid twenties, okay. and um, you have, a year or two ex experience of a year or two and then you feel when you come here and then let's say you come here for public health you come here for mhi you come here for healthcare administration and then while you are in school and you feel this is too much this is too much but i'm going to do it very well and you do it very well and you get a job i have seen so many people 
during the entire time that I have been here, just being very happy with the job that they got. And this is, this is like tried and tested. If you are that person who is okay without dentistry in life, there cannot be a better career in research in nonprofits from an MPH or from an MHI. I have seen people leave that and do and enjoy that um, because it is short. It's, it, it's, there comes a cost as well to that. So if you have to calculate all of it, like in, you know, in that early age in life, if you are earning so good, you have a very good job with, with your grad education, then people don't want to go through that way. To me, I was like a butthead who wanted to, I cannot survive without my, my career, which is dentistry. So that's me. But if you don't want to do that, it is fine. It is amazing. It is, it's a, it's a rewarding career as well. That's how I must put that. Like, you know, um, you can work in research. I, I can say like with MPH, you can work in research in the U S it is not like, uh, you know, like as difficult to find jobs in comparison to other streams, but research is like something that is done by every university. So applying for jobs in the university, which are research related, it's, they are fairly easier in comparison to outside in private, you know, in the private employer, as per the visa limitations, you know about it. So um, you, you, really, you really can get settled here early in life, even if you do not want to go towards that direction. And with MHI, I, um, I, I bring up MHI. So my husband did, um, master's in health informatics. And uh, we both had our uh, you know, pros and cons of MPH versus MHI. But uh, and we both work, we both work, he's still working, uh, but I see him working to another level, which I, even I didn't do. So I, I yeah, it was, <laughs> it's hard for me to say that, but um, it, to the work that he is doing or he is contributing, it is, it is something, it's commendable. So if I, I, oftentimes it is not my stream. I am not interested into, you know, being an analyst and all that. It's, it's a lot of hard work and a um, lot of coding. And I'm not that person, that computer loving person. But if you are that person that, you know, you're good at, um, you know, computer and learning things and, you know, like engineering, uh, like uh, if you have an engineering mind behind, then MHI is a very good option because it gives you really like, uh, it, it makes you learn a lot apart from the US things. And then and it, it ends up giving you a very good job. Excellent. So it would not be fair to compare MHA and MPH uh, rewards versus rewards after DDS. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't compare because dentistry to me is a soul feeding experience. So I cannot compare it to anything else, um, whether in like not even in terms of rewards, it's about what you do should bring you um, not only joy, it should bring you contentment. And that's what I ran after, not happiness, contentment. So that's why DDS for me is contentment. You, you are all into dentistry. I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> and now students are wondering, okay, uh, you know, let's say we, we, we want to get into DDS. What, uh, what amount of funding, scholarships? This is probably one of the uh, biggest uh, roadblocks and the point where uh, people have no clue here. Mm -hmm. So um, before I start with the DDS, um, you know, cost, let me tell you about public health, informatics, healthcare administration, and other things as well. So two years of education, somewhere, some at some schools, it is one and a half or one year, give or take. You invest somewhere around 50K to 70, 75K, depending upon which university you get access to, right? So two years of education, straight investment of 50K, once you, and I'm talking like a very, uh, you know, like a banya buddhi here, but I think it is important when you're making that decision back home 
uh, what what is like it's an investment you're investing in your career right so you you invest this much money and then you invest your time effort two years after that when you have a job it is fairly decent to pay off that loans with that grad education that you earn so you put this much but you get almost higher right so it's 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 doable it makes you settled now when it comes to and then after mph there is another program that is dental public health which is a one year program eligibility for that is public health so if someone wants to practice in the us without dds another roadway is you have an mph you go through dental public health and it is not that difficult to get in in comparison to other programs and then you can ha- you are eligible to take licensure exams for dentist like as being a being a dentist but that's in limited states so if you want to limit yourself that's another way there are multiple ways to get a us dental license it's dds is it's just one of them but the most can be like i would say most can be most convenient and it allows you more freedom to go and that way but anyway so coming to dds and the funding so mph you can have scholarships you are eligible for teaching assistantship and you know like gras as well but dds it's not that simple to get funding uh, to get a scholarship here funding is somewhere around depending it varies from school to school programs to programs but if i were um someone to know about how much will go from my pocket it's somewhere around 200k over the course of 2 years to and a half years so 200k to 300 like for my education it is somewhere around 300k for the entire 2 and 29 months program you cannot have that money out of pocket at least i could not it's a huge amount but the way things work here is like if you have a co-signer and that's the first step before even you plan dds if you have a co-signer who is ready to be your guarantor uh, you know because you are only eligible for private student loans here you're not eligible for federal loans because we're not citizens or you know if you're a green card holder that's a different thing but if you're on visa you're only eligible for private student loan so if someone is willing to sign for you you get loans very easily it's quick and then you pay off but yes it is a huge investment that goes into your career so that also should be um taken into consideration because i have had uh, met some of the friends during this journey who had to leave the program because they didn't have the co-signer even like after two semesters so that should like that's why i brought that up that that has to be taken into consideration apart from everything because funding is a huge thing um yeah you can also borrow loans from back home but you know the rate of interest is too high you would not like it but uh, that's an option but if you have resources yes go for it so a co-signer has to be a green card holder or resident yes Yes, a co-signer has to be a either a green card holder or a US citizen for you for yeah for him to sign for you. And that's a liability that people take that you know obviously it's saying that if you don't pay that money off he's going to pay that money. So you need to have that level of bond and that level of trust with that person in order for him or her to sign for you because he's taking the charge. that's where you have to have certain level of advantages absolutely yeah so plan for that that's the first step nbd is not the first step i would say and that's being very honest <laughs> think about the finances that how are you going to fund your education 1.5 cr minimum if it's in one part figure then for that i mean you know it it's practically not possible from from and it, then uh, yes absolutely and i did not include cost of living here So on an average um, cost of living I would say a place like Minneapolis here um I would I would consider it somewhere around 1500 1500 that includes everything inclusive of uh, your stay and everything so it is expensive most of the 
So, you, you know, like when you're applying to other programs in other fields, you look about cost of living as well, you know, the, the tuition from university or, you know, where it is fair, where, you know, you debate that. Unfortunately, that's not what we do here for DDS. It's like it's competitive. You apply to like 10 to 15 programs wherever you get accepted. Let's say if you get accepted to four or five universities. Well, you do compare cost of living a little bit here and there, but it's not going to be like, uh, you know, diff like a very big difference. It doesn't make a very big difference, except for few schools, which are um, the tuition is less. But um, the likelihood of you getting accepted into those schools is like, we don't know. And um, of course, it's obvious that when you're, when you're spending that much of uh, amount of money on DDS and because you will be practic as a, practicing as a dentist, so the perks are at some other level. So that is understandable. It's, it's, it's every penny worth. So, mm -hmm. so even keeping that aside and having understood that, what would be the uh, usual packages that you might have observed post MPH people getting and maybe MHI also just putting a light on that? Yeah, you, <laughs> that makes me, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I'm happy to be honest and uh, share this, that yes, after an MPH, I would say uh, you are worthy <laughs> of at least 65 to 75K right mm -hmm. after when you graduate, yeah. But depend, again, depends upon your experience. So I would advise while you're in grad school, and it's, I know as an Indian and, you know, um, coming from the society and the, you know, the things that work back home, you obviously uh, will work more hard than you even thought coming to here. You'll do what not to survive. Survive as in like earn your livelihood and do the student jobs and all those things. But get your experience in things which you think you're going to put it in your resume when you're applying for a job. That is very important. That thoughtfulness is very important. It is very easy to, you know, pack your bags, come to the US, explore the campus and okay, start working in dining, start working in cafeteria. It's very, it, everybody does that. I have done that, right? But that's just one part of it. Do not forget the main goal that, okay, uh, well, if I were to, if someone were, was to hire me, what will the person look at, look at, you know? So work, start working in field that you th see yourself in two years from when you graduate, it could be nonprofit organization. So let's say if someone wants to work in a nonprofit, nonprofits, um, just like back home, we have nonprofits, they have nonprofits here as well like very, uh, like in a bit, uh, at higher level. So start shadowing, start looking for internships, go to people. The most important thing here is to, you know, to actually follow them, go to them, ask for jobs, ask for um, volunteering so that you can observe and start working with them, help in getting some hands-on uh, internship field experience so that that builds your profile in two years. So then right when you graduate, you have something like a strong foundation that you have, not just your degree. Let me tell you, it's not the degree that gets your job. It's the experience that you have while you are doing that degree that gets you a job. That is very important. Don't take it as like, you know, just fun and wasting that time, just doing the student job studying and then get over it. People do experience problems. Even in my, uh, like even back, you know, and um, I remember I had a colleague, uh, I had a colleague from China. He didn't do it. He, he, he was, he took it very easy. He had to go home. He waited for the whole entire OPT, didn't find a job, volunteered here and there, but he had to go home. Things like that are unfortunate. That doesn't happen with most of the people because everybody is hardworking. The person who has aimed coming to the US is hard working. They don't just do it. And so, you know, while they're in India, right? Um, what all they should be doing apart from, from their conventional, uh, you know, bachelor's degree here in dentistry? Because uh, now you know that these are the things that you would recommend uh, every dentist, either they're coming from MPH or MHI, should it, it's a must thing in their resume, something on that? 
Yes, I would say if you are uh, willing to come to the US for whichever career path, whether it is dentistry, whether it is public health, MHI, and you are, let's say, in final year of your uh, school, you're a freshman, before even your internship, utilize that time of internship when you're doing clinical rotations into studying, let's say, let's talk about a dentistry first. If you want to be DDS here, utilize that time of internship into reading about uh, and into, um, you know, preparing for NBD. Now it's a collective exam. So earlier it was part one and part two. It's still there for some people who did it um, before a certain amount of time, but now they have combined the exam. So study for that, get that thing cleared. When you are there, do a lot of community service, build your profile that way, not just going to school and clinical rotation, do an extra edge, like, you know, write papers. It is very important. They see this as a, a very, uh, you know, like Isaac said, that you're contributing to the scientific community. That's what research is about. That's what papers is about. Write papers, get them published, right? If you do all these, take a time, come here, if you can come here, um, I know visa limitations are there, there's not really much that you can do when you are on a tourist visa, you cannot be paid, right? Don't do those things, people try to do those things to what not to do so that you can get in, but something that is not uh, ethical, never do that because they, if they find out then that's, um, that's trouble. So if, because we know that there are limitations on a tourist visa, but invest your time coming in here volunteering at a dental clinic is something that you can do. Even on a tourist visa, people do that. And that's a, they see that, that you're taking efforts to, you know, to be here. That's what I, I that's how I feel. Nobody knows the, you know, the, the secret of how did you get into the dental school, but these are all the processes. This is like a process. And these are all the methods that all of us, my colleagues or people, those who I know of have been uh, part of my journey have done that do that. So being in uh, being home, yes, and work on your GPA, it's very important. We, we often forget, you know, we take it cool, but work on your GPA. Don't, don't let the GPA down and affect you in applying to the dental school because you cannot correct that. Once it is, it is done, there is no going back. So take it seriously when you're in school. GPA means the percentage is here. Let's say what, you know the system I have here. What percentage do you think should they have? I mean, what GPA, 70, 75, 65, what should be a decency GPA? So um, every school has different perspective on GPA. There are some schools who, who want to see a, a GPA more than 3.5. There are some schools who are okay with an average GPA, which is three. There are some schools who do not look at GPA at all. They look at other factors and overall profile. So it varies. But when you're applying to the school, you're not just applying to one school, you're applying to multiple schools because it is competitive. So if you're applying to 10, 12 schools, that means you're also applying to those schools which have criteria of 3.5 and more. So would you want to risk that? No, if you are planning that I want to be, um, you know, I, I want to get accepted, then first step is like, if you are, if it is in your hands, if you're a freshman, you're, while you're uh, having that dream of pursuing DDS, don't let that opportunity in that moment go. But if it has already gone, and if you have an average GPA of three or less, don't get disappointed because there are other factors that you can do to for the, them to see in your profile. That's not the only thing. But if you are starting, let's start with uh, with that farsightedness that, okay, I have to do that. So let's work on this now. Before we have your final words of wisdom, let's have a few questions, right? So Anjali yes. has has a question because she's asking what was your major in MPH and uh, what was the OPT status related to it and the jobs? My, uh, yeah, my major was public health administration and uh, policy. And um, this was, yeah, this was my major. I had a one year OPT. 
I was fortunate and I would say hard earned, but I had the job during, even before when I graduated and a good one here. And because it was probably not STEM, right? It is not STEM. So MPH and epidemiology was STEM, but my program was not a STEM um, degree. I had one year of OPT. So OPT means like, you know, you have to find a job before your OPT expires. And then before your OPT expires, not just to have the job, but to have a sponsor, uh, uh, an employer ready for you to sponsor H1B. So that's also STEM is something like, okay, it, you get, you buy more time. Sometimes you may not end up having. You got your H1B take in the first attempt? Yes, yes, I, yeah, I got it in the first attempt. And uh, so this is uh, when I applied for the job that I'm currently doing as well. I'm doing part-time. I never left my job because I love it. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I am working uh, on the same job, just part-time because of the, you know, visa limitations. Now we cannot work more than 20 hours. So when I applied for this job and I, um, I, I uh, so I got accepted two places. I was about to move to Chicago, a senior role, uh, lead position. I didn't accept that position. I accepted here at the, at the U of M because it was here um, in Minneapolis and I, I, I didn't want to move. So when I even applied for that applied for the job, when I got accepted uh, for my job, when I like got the offer, the first thing you will not believe shouldn't be asked, but I did ask my employer about it. That, in a very humble way, obviously, that uh, would you be willing to sponsor an H one B? I know it is uh, it's a it's it's a require it's it's something that is necessary for me to be here in the U S. So and you know how, so like if you say in a nice way. You would not believe that within three minutes, I got the call saying, we are willing to help you with your H1. When are you going to join? You will not believe the second day of my phone call was my joining date. It was that quick. So if they like you, if they like you, they will do it for you. But for them to like you, you need to do that. You need to do a lot of work to do that. You have to make yourself likable, so absolutely. Yeah, and I was lucky that I got my H1 baked in the first time. Uh, first time, so. And you know, of course, uh, you you went to US and of course the whole family. Right? And how the things put for the doll shaped up? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I have a nine-year-old. She is nine now. When we came yeah. here, she was five. You will not believe. Uh, it took us time as parents, as students, uh, as grad students to, you know, get accustomed to how things work. Just like I said, catching bus from one place to another, going in the wrong direction. This was me oftentimes going in the wrong direction on the bus, getting a wrong bus, simple things. But for her, if you were to see her now, if you were to listen to her now, it was so smooth. Like she did, like in two weeks, I felt like, who is this person? Who is this little creature who came with me on the plane to US? She was so smooth at transition that even we were surprised that we are still adapting. It's the first semester. We are still adapting. Man, this person, kids are very smart. She, it was very easy for her to adapt and transition. In fact, she loves it. She loves being here. She has more friends than I have. She's more famous and, and social <laughs> among the community that, than anybody, than both of us. So yeah, it was very smooth for my daughter, but not as smooth for us. It took time. And then the schooling and the financial aspect of it was a, it was a burden. So schooling here is free for kids. If you, you can go to, yeah, for kids, uh, you, our kids go to, like kids can go to public school. That's what more majority of the US um, goes to public school. Even people, even the citizens, even, you know, people, the, the, the Americans, majority go to public school and public school is free. The only burden that you have to have because I'm on a visa is I was, uh, so for my visa status now, that is again F1, now that I'm a student and she's on dependent, she's a dependent on me. 
So um, insurance is something that we have to take. It's like a mandatory thing if you're an international student. So you need to borrow insurance from the university. So she is on me. So that is the only finances that go if I talk about finances regarding to her, but not her schooling. But again, it's nice. Uh, it's it's free. It's it's up till high school. It is free. It's amazing. But then you pay the price thereafter. So undergrad is expensive. <laughs> so you pay the price later, not now. I thought that the, the later prices, if they have to be paid for the kids also, then it's a huge cost and it's almost unaffordable. Yes, that's true. There are some people who send their kids to private school. Well, if you can afford that sometimes, then for sure, there's um, there are private schools that you can send your kids to. But if you can afford, it's very expensive, but um, definitely not when you are a student. But yes, when you are working later in life, you can send your schools to uh, send your kids to private schools. That's very important. And I think a good question from Ante. Um, how about preparing for NBD while you are also engrossed in the MPH and uh, the way you put up that research intensive? So is it manageable or not or what? Okay, this is a question that I'm of, I had been often asked when I was a student because my friends and uh, even my professors, they saw me r like running around. I'm, even now I'm always running around. So yes, it is difficult to manage time because the burden of the courses that you take in public health, they demand a lot of time and attention in case of writing papers, as I said, assignments back to back. You have to be working uh, for your job because that's how you support yourself and your family. But then it is, it is not that it's not doable. Again, I said, choose your courses wisely. So, um, it is doable. People do it with the uh, MPH as well. So there are times when you don't have, let's say if you have courses which are two credits, which do not really um, ask so many assignments from you, maybe that semester you can take. Three to four, uh, so I took part one in three months, but that was back home. So three months, I studied for three months and took part one, but that time I was practicing. I would say that was more difficult for me versus it was here. And then uh, part two, I almost studied for four weeks, I should say. So yeah, it was tough, but you manage time. I think time management is the key for any profession. You, If you are aiming for DDS, one, uh, a very crucial thing is like time management because even during DDS, you, will, you have like, I have exams every alternate day. So, Apart from, and I don't really get to go, I don't really, I'm home to study. I am the like whole day passes in school. I come home by six and after six, obviously my family, and I don't really get that much time, but then whatever time you get, you have to study. So if you have, if you know how to manage time, you can do anything. Fantastic. And of course, uh, you're already past the time. And I cannot hear you. We are already past the time that, you know, hello. I cannot hear you. Hello. I think rest of you can hear me, guys. Uh, yes, sir. We can hear you, but your voice is a little low. Hello. Uh, Ankita, can you hear me? Again. Uh, okay. I'll text her. Or maybe uh, we can have our final Hello, words, Anana. Uh, okay. Sure, sir. Yeah. Or, or maybe uh, if she can, again, for last two minutes, she can join back, leave and join back. Because we'll just have two, three minutes more. Yeah, she would be joining back. Guys, please fill the form. I would highly appreciate your feedback. And do come to Globalizers. We are at Tulsi Tower, Geeta Bhavan. Come for uh, a counseling session. We can meet, we can discuss. And definitely looking forward to, you know, meeting you for further. There are some questions related to MPH. Uh, Biostatistics and epidemiology are actually two options which we will have. Ankita, can you hear me? Yes, now. I don't know what's happening, but I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. It's still fine. So, uh, I mean, of course, before before really thanking you, we're already past the time that we had promised you for. <laughs> so, that's okay. Uh, love to have your uh, final words, you know, on your journey so far and, you know, 
your words of wisdom for every study abroad aspirant, including healthcare professionals. Absolutely. First of all, I really want to say thank you, Prashant sir. Thank you, Nena and the team Globalizers for organizing this. I'm really honored. It's a um, it's very it's it's very emotional at the moment for me to to you know to to say thank you and um, to do this. I have uh, had amazing experiences, life experiences, professional experiences that uh, that helped me kept moving forward in the journey that I have been doing, the, the journey that I have been put on or had chose to. I believe words of wisdom for people who ever want to study abroad, including dentistry and healthcare profession, profession is uh, you need to find what soothes your heart. That's very important because I've, I've seen people who are um, who graduate and then you they don't really know what to do. Okay, what should I do after I have done this? Now, what should I do? No, it is very important to get yourself sorted before you actually jump into anything. So think about it. Do your research, meet people. There are so many resources. We are living in the age of technology. Do some homework and find out what do you think you would want to do and then have a plan from right from scratch. When I came here the first time I was a tourist to write NBD exam. That was the first time when I came here with my daughter. The second time I came here was without her. It was very well planned to come here just to have the US, US experience. And that involved volunteering, that involved community service as a dental assistant and whatnot. You have to have a plan. If you have a plan, the likelihood of you getting there is easier versus when you're up in the air. So words of wisdom would be, if you're a freshman, Think about what, where you want to go, what are the things that you can do. If you want to do public health or take these courses, like for example, healthcare and other professions in, in apart from dentistry, you need to start working on GRE as well. Take it seriously. People don't take seriously. People, those who are not from engineering background do not take GRE very seriously. They feel like, oh, it's just a score. And no, take it very seriously. If you really want to um, study in a good university or, you know, get accepted and don't want to feel into that, that don't want to fall into that category of uh, I'm not getting accepted, then you work on the score. The better your papers look because then you're not here. But once you get accepted, then start building your profile and do everything that you can do. And again, I said, research is something I would highly emphasize if you are doing public health or even healthcare administration. Get involved into the universities and nonprofits. They help you a lot and you gain a lot. And that's good to, they, they give you good recommendation letters as well. I didn't touch on that, but it is important to have a very good recommendation letter from somebody who is uh, maybe who could be your professor, who could be a, a dentist that you are working with, or anybody who knows you who can write really personal letter of recommendation for you. But you only get a personal of, personal recommendation from someone who knows you, right? If I were to ask for a letter of recommendation from Prashant sir, I'm very I'm very sure he would write a very good one because he knows me, right? There's a trust, but. He, in order for you to build that trust and that communication, you have to go out of your comfort zone to actually do something, show that person so that the person can do that, can write a letter for you. So I would just say, keyword, have a plan, have that farsightedness that this is my school, I'm going to study here. And meanwhile, I'm here, this, these are the things that I'm going to be doing. It can be building connections, it can be gaining experience, the US dental, non-dental experience, having your resume, polishing yourself, the way you communicate or whatnot. It can be simple things, but have that plan so that when you submit your application, people can see that on your paper. They have not seen you yet. They will see you during your interview. Do bench, bench prep courses back home now. We have bench prep courses in India as well. Work on that. Work on that because hand skills are also an important part for uh, getting accepted into the dental school. Fantastic, wonderfully put, Ankita. And uh, 
you really epitomize that one saying that you're totally uh, one decision away from a totally different life. So you have done that and you have reached your position and we would want to see you finishing your DDS and definitely, um, you know, getting back to the practicing of dentistry, which is something that you're super passionate about. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very excited for that. It's been a month now in the program, but it feels like I've already been living here since forever <laughs> because it is very, very hectic, but worthy for sure. Thank you so much. And audience also follow us on various social media platforms so that you can be updated about various activities and accomplishments, inspiring accomplishments of uh, uh, students. And do fill the feedback form so that we can, uh, you know, improve our services in in longer run. Thank you again. Thank you, Nana, and thank you again. Have a good weekend, and you know, we, we I can't appreciate enough your entire journey so far. Thank you so much, Prashant, sir, for this opportunity. I, uh, it's a very small word to say thank you, but I mean very deeply. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey and um, having that belief in me and allowing me this chance today to speak and help people and answer their questions. And um, if anybody wants to know anything more about or you know, feel free to reach out via email. He, I, if you know, Prashant sir can share the email. I'd be happy to help anybody who would have any questions in the future as well. Thank you so much, everybody, um, and the team globalizers. Thank you, and thank you, Nana, again for organizing, being very sweet, and have a wonderful weekend, all of you. Enjoy your Saturday night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.